Hello, my name is Sean Boyle and I'm with Southern Illinois University and in this video we're going to look at what you're actually changing when you go through and recalibrate your transmission using HP tuners. So in this first video we're going to talk about these components, the TECM, the Transmission Electrohydraulic Control Module, TCM, and how it controls this component which is part of the valve body, it contains all the valves that controls the clutches in the transmission. And that ultimately controls this component, which is one of the clutches, the 456 clutch, or the 35R, and the 1234, or the 26 in the lower reverse. So all these different parts are interconnected. This TECM is going to control the valve body, the valve body is going to control the clutches. And we really need to have a basic understanding of this because our tune, our calibration that we're changing in this TECM is going to affect all of that and that's what ultimately gives us our shift feel, the shift quality, and even the durability in this transmission. So as you get into this video, if things feel overwhelming or over the top, we'll realize that on this channel with the Automatic Transmissions playlist, I have some introductory videos that kind of give you the basic knowledge of how automatic transmissions operate, and then more specific stuff on the 6L80, everything from overhaul to the in-depth operation of the hydraulics and the mechanical. So you might want to cruise through and look at some of those videos if some of this seems a little overwhelming or maybe I've piqued your interest and maybe you just want to learn a little bit more about this transmission. Now I'd like to place a big thanks to Nick Middlebrun for helping me with this project. He spent a lot of time, he was behind the wheel collecting all this data in his spare time there and between the two of us we burned at least three, t uh, three tanks of gas through this truck and left about 10 pounds of rubber on the floor behind the dyno. And first let's talk about what you're actually going through and changing. This little device right here is mounted inside the transmission. It's called the TECM, the Transmission Electrohydraulic Control Module. They call it that because there's a computer right here and this computer which your vehicle's talking through and receiving power through this little connector right there is going to control this series of solenoids. And these solenoids ultimately are going to control the quality of your shift. This is shift solenoid one. It's an on-off solenoid. This is the actual line pressure solenoid. It's also called solenoid one on our scan tools. And this next one down is the one, two, three, four solenoid. It controls the one, two, three, four clutch. And it's referred to as the solenoid number five. This one right here is our torque converter clutch solenoid. And then behind this chunk of plastic right there is shift solenoid two. It's an on-off solenoid, just like the first solenoid over there. And this guy right there, that is our 35R solenoid. And it's also referred to as solenoid number two. And that one there is the 2.6 solenoid. It controls pressure to the 2.6 clutch. And it's also referred to as solenoid four. And last but not least is our 4.5.6 clutch solenoid and that is often listed as solenoid three on the scan tool. And like I mentioned, that is our um, computer, or that's actually a heat sink. The computer is right inside there. This whole transmission control module assembly, or this TECM, you can't go through and change these individual solenoids. If one goes bad, you pretty much are going to replace this whole thing. Uh, it's all kind of sealed together, and the process they use when they I don't know how they do it, but they, they uh, basically assemble this thing, build it as a unit to the point where you can't replace any one part in this. You just replace it as a whole. The reason why this is important, because when we hook up our uh, MPVI, our, our interface, and we're communicating through the diagnostic link connector, we're actually communicating through this transmission control module right here, and through the CAN bus connection in there, we're going through and not only reading the data from this using the VCM scanner, but we're also tuning it through the CAN bus and changing the calibration right here through this module um, specifically. Now I'm going to cover a few hydraulic things before we get deep into the actual tuning side of things. The reason why I'm doing that is because I think it's important to understand how this transmission operates hydraulically. Now I do have a complete hydraulic lesson on this transmission but I'm just gonna give you a couple tidbits here that we need to look at before we get into this tuning. And this AFL valve right here, it's responsible for controlling pressure 
to the solenoids. I just went through and showed you all those different solenoids. Well, those solenoids don't receive full line pressure. They're gonna receive a reduced pressure determined by this valve, the actuator feed limit. Now, on this hydraulic schematic, that's actually a picture of the AFL valve as it would sit in the valve body. It receives line pressure, but the pressure that finds its way out is a reduced pressure. Well, I shouldn't say it's reduced, it's actually limited. It just won't go as high as line pressure can go. Line pressure can go well over 200 PSI on this transmission, but the AFL pressure, as I have listed here, it's gonna be somewhere between 110 and 125 PSI max. So that way we're not gonna bombard these solenoids with more than, let's say 120 PSI or so. The operation of this, of this AFL valve is actually pretty simple. Line pressure is gonna find its way into this passage and find its way out into the AFL circuit. AFL pressure that lets in, that line pressure, should say, that gets its way into the AFL passage is gonna find its way to the end of that valve right there. And then when that moves this valve over far enough, it's gonna end up blocking off its passageway. It's not gonna let any more of that pressure in. That's how it regulates itself. It's all determined by the strength of that spring. So this spring tension right here is what determines the ultimate AFL pressure. The reason why I mention this is because when we start tuning things, we're gonna see some little sections where we can change the values of the pressure values in this transmission. The first one we're gonna look at today is called max pressure A. And you're gonna notice it's set from the factory at like 110 PSI. Well, there's nothing uh, in this transmission that's gonna operate that low other than these little solenoids right here, the solenoid pressure. So um, I theorize that max pressure A is actually telling the computer what our AFL pressure is. And we're gonna go through when we do our tests, we're gonna determine if that's actually the fact or not. So actuator feed limit pressure is important, but so is line pressure. And the way we generate line pressure in this transmission is this pump assembly that we have, it's a variable output pump, and it rotates the center section, which is called a rotor, it rotates. You can see the arrow, it's gonna rotate clockwise, it's drawn here. And that's going to allow fluid to be sucked in from the pan through the filter and kind of enter this pump cavity right there. So as this rotates, we get like an expanding area and that creates a suction. And then when it comes around, it squeezes off and that compresses the fluid and pressurizes it, pushes it through the line pressure circuits. And if we look up top here, we've got a pressure regulator valve. And one of the areas that that line pressure goes to is on the top side of this line pressure valve. That's actually gonna push this valve down and work against this spring. This is a fixed spring that's in there, so you always have to overcome that spring. When that valve gets pushed down, that line pressure eventually is gonna find its way into this passage right here called the decrease passage. And if you follow it down, it goes to the outside of this pump slide. So once they have enough pressure as determined by the pressure regulator valve, the excess pressure finds its way into this decrease passage and it pivots this pump slide over. There's a pivot pin right there and a seal right there. So when fluid finds its way into this section right there, it's gonna pivot this outer pump slide over. And when it does that, it's gonna equalize the space around this pump rotor. And when we equalize the space around the pump rotor, we're not gonna be able to create a suction to pull fluid in, and we're not gonna have a collapsing area to compress it out. So that limits the pressure. Now how we change the pressure in this transmission is we have a line pressure solenoid. It receives that 110 to 125 PSI, the actua actuator feed limit pressure, and it delivers that, depending on how the solenoid is being operated, it delivers that into this pressure control solenoid line pressure passage. That finds its way into this boost valve. And fluid pressure, the 100, basically zero to let's just say 120 PSI, is gonna work itself on the bottom side of this boost valve, and it's gonna add force to that spring. So not only will line pressure have to overcome the tension of that spring, but it's also gonna to have to overcome whatever boost pressure that is added to this valve lineup. So when they operate the solenoid, when they turn the solenoid on, and they pulse with modulate the solenoid, but when they pulse with modulate the solenoid on to its max, it's actually gonna have no fluid pressure in here. So it's going to have to overcome just the spring uh, tension. And they pretty much never operate it under that circumstance. And then as they turn that solenoid off, the more off I create it, so it's a normally open solenoid, as they turn the solenoid off, that allows more of that AFL pressure into the circuit. 
So as pressure builds up, more line pressure is going to be required to overcome the spring and the pressure that we have in the uh, boost valve circuit in order to get to the point where it will regulate itself and reduce the output. So that's just kind of a quick, brief throwdown on how this pump works. It's a variable output pump. Uh, that way they're not loading the engine up with more uh, resistance than necessary. It pretty much will pump whatever the transmission requires and no more. So here is that 6L80 oil pump. And you can see, you now this would be rotating, since you're seeing it from the back end, it'd be rotating counterclockwise. But as this rotates, it'll create a low pressure area there, down at the bottom, suction, carry the fluid around and squeeze it out up there. Now this is that decrease passage. There's that pivot pin and a seal. So when the pressure regulator says we've got enough pressure, it'll actually introduce fluid into this passageway right here. And that will move the pivot over you know, equalize the space around that uh, pump rotor. Oh, Jesus, that pump rotor. I'm all right. <laughs> Bell housing, it's ringing. So that's how that works. I bet my, it's got a lot of tension on that spring. So to recap, we looked at the AFL valve, and the AFL valve is responsible for limiting the pressure that goes to the solenoids. And we also saw that the line pressure solenoid can deliver pressure to the pressure regulator valve to control the ultimate maximum pressure in this transmission. Well, another place that actuator feed limit goes is to the individual clutch solenoids. So as I mentioned with that Tecum, we've got all these different solenoids controlling all these different clutches. And what those do, so we got pressure up to 110 or 120 PSI, and then these solenoids are gonna deliver between zero and 110 or 120 PSI to a, a couple, one or two regulator valves that are gonna control the pressure to the individual clutches. So think of how many layers of important items we've got here. We have actuator feed limit valves that are extremely important because all the solenoids are gonna be using that. We've got the Tecum, which is gonna be the computer that's gonna be controlling all the solenoids. We have all these solenoids that are controlling pressure, and those pressure that they're controlling is going to pressure regulator valves, either controlling the pump or the clutches themselves. So a lot of things are interconnected. Now looking at the 6L80 or 6L90 transmission, and really 6L50 as well, it's got three driving clutches. A driving clutch is a clutch that's taking engine torque through the torque converter and is driving a part of the gear set. And then we have two holding clutches, and a holding clutch is a part that holds a part of the gear set to the transmission case. Then we have a one-way clutch, which is used to hold the carrier for first gear. Um, so our three driving clutches are the one, two, three, four clutch, so it's applied in first, second, third, and fourth. The three, five R, so it's applied in third, fifth, and reverse. And then the four, five, six clutch, which is applied in the fourth, fifth, and sixth gears. And our two holding clutches, the two, six clutch, and the low reverse clutch, and our one-way sprag. This is what they call a range reference chart, but because the names are pretty easy to follow, you can, as long as you know the names of the clutches, you pretty much already know what's applied and when. So to uh, reiterate, I know I already mentioned this, but we have our one, two, three, four clutch, three, five R and four, five, six clutch. Those are the driving clutches, three, five R, one, two, three, four housing. So the four, five, six clutch assembly is actually part of the drum that is connected to the transmission's input shaft. Then we also have a couple holding clutches. The 2.6 is a holding clutch, as I mentioned before, and the low reverse. So this 2.6 clutch is part of this center support assembly. And on the other side is the low sprag, right here in the middle, and then the low reverse clutch is located around it. Those are our two holding clutches. It's worth mentioning all that because there's a lot of modifications that you can do to these transmissions internally. Uh, you might find hardened shafts or different pistons, some billet pistons or some different quality clutch components that you can change around. And another reason why it's important mention, to mention is, and we'll cover this when we look at clutch clearances, is because there are sections on HP tuners where you can go through and change and modify the clutch volumes, if you will. And 
every one of these clutches are going to have a certain amount of piston movement, which means it's going to displace a certain amount of volume when we go from off to on. And that's going to be determined by the clutch pack clearance that I've got. So you can imagine how important it is that A, we, are, we have our clutch pack clearances set right, and B, that we understand that those volumes that are listed in HP tuners or just in their general program, that's going to inform the computer of how much of a piston stroke is going to occur before this clutch pack clearance is taken up. So if you're ever taking these things apart to rebuild them, definitely measure your clutch pack clearance and make sure they are within specifications. You know, the, the clearances are not a huge range. So that's 48 to 70 thousandths, and here's 60 to 78 thousandths. Then it looks like 50 to 74, that's, and then 51 to 81. So that's the biggest range on the low reverse that they give you. Actually, low reverse isn't even that important because that's not a, um, a synchronized shift. But all these others, you're seeing maybe 24 thousandths, 18 to 24 thousandths of a window of clearance. And, in my opinion, you wouldn't want to be on the extreme ends of either one of those uh, specifications either. So what controls the ultimate shift feel in this transmission? I mean, that's our main goal here, using HP tuners and changing the tables is we want a firmer shift, uh, we want a, um, a, maybe even a softer shift, I don't know, depending on what you guys want, but what are we actually, how are we controlling that and what's uh, the transmission doing to kind of give us a quality shift? Well, one of the things that we'll note is that a 6L80, 6L90 doesn't have any accumulators. If we look at older transmissions, they've got these spring-loaded accumulators that give kind of a fluid uh, place to go to provide a cushion, so that way the clutch applies a little bit less violently or can, can apply softly. Um, the 6L80 and 6L90, it does not have any accumulators. So one thing that they do have that pretty much all transmissions have is a piston return spring. So when a clutch is released, we want that piston to be retracted all the way in its bore. And then when we apply the clutch, we're gonna have to overcome whatever spring is holding that piston back. So that can actually work as a cushioning device to a point. And in these clutches also, they have wave plates. They've got plates that are not, they got steel and friction, steel and friction, but at the bottom, they usually have some kind of a cushioning device, something to take the impact off of that clutch so it doesn't jar when it applies. And in most cases, it's either a dished plate or it's a wave plate. So that is another form of accumulation that they've got. They also have orifices in the valve body. So the spacer plate between the, uh, the valve body halves, some of those holes are going to be engineered to a, a certain size, and that's gonna control the rate of fluid application through that uh, um, plate. And by controlling the rate, they can control how quickly fluid enters the circuit. They can control the apply rate. And then lastly, we're going to talk about, it's most important because it's something that we have control over with HP tuners, is the clutch pressure control. So the applying or oncoming clutch and the releasing, the offgoing clutch pressure, is going to control the shift quality. Now looking at these different phases, the fill phase is kind of self-explanatory. That's when the clutch assembly is filling up with fluid and you're maybe stroking that piston just to the point where those frictions are about ready to touch. So they estimate the amount of time it's going to take to fill that. And then the next phase you can see is kind of just running right off of the end of that fill phase is the torque phase. And the torque phase is that portion where there's no ratio that's changing but we're, we're getting the off-going clutch to release. And then we've got the oncoming clutch kind of building up pressure and taking hold. And then this inertia phase right here is when the ratio actually starts changing. So by the time the ratio, the, the speed ratio is changing, we're going from a low gear to a high gear. If that's uh, an upshift, we're expecting the offgoing clutch to be off. And then during this inertia phase, the oncoming clutch to basically apply. So this is actually that shift time that we observe when we feel like a three-tenths of a second shift or something like that that's going to be the portion because we're actually going to feel the engine speed drop and the ratio change during this inertia phase. And then lastly, when the clutch is finally applied and we don't see the ratio change anymore, they go into this torque holding phase or the final portion, the final holding, torque holding. You'll find different names for it, but um, these are the really the four different phases of a shift. And when we look at some of the pressures, I'm going to kind of almost combine this fill and torque phase 
because I think that kind of runs into each other and there's, it's harder to tell the division between those two when you're looking at actual pressure readings. This right here is a Ford patent and they're basically showing the same thing where when we look at the oncoming clutch, we've got that fill phase and then we've got the torque phase and then when that offgoing pressure drops off, we start the inertia phase and that's when the ratio changes. And then once that ratio is done changing, we go into that final holding stage or that torque holding stage, whatever they want to call it. So going to what we did here on our little experiments, we got a 2014 Chevy Silverado and we've got a Superflow in-ground all-wheel drive dyno. Of course, uh, it wasn't able to run it all-wheel drive because it couldn't open up wide enough. But what we did is we warmed the truck up, then we uploaded the tune, then we performed and recorded a bunch of cycles of upshifts. When we were done, we saved the OBS, which is a screen recorder, uh, the log file, uh, the HP Tuner's log, the scanner, um, and the Pico files. Pico is our uh, scope that we use to monitor all the pressures. Now, all this is free. Uh, you don't really care about OBS, but you can download HP Tuners for free and open up those log files, and you could download Pico uh, picoauto.com for free and upload those files if you want to play around with that. I'm going to put all of these files up on, a, on my website so you guys can download those and mess with them as you feel like you want to. So we performed a bunch of sequences at different throttle positions and that was the trickiest part. We did a final recording when everything is stabilized. So we, we did all these shifts and we monitored using some of the table features, we monitored the shift speeds and we watch shift speeds when we first did the change and then because it's going to adapt and eventually once it adapted and it basically was consistent with its shift speeds, we uh, did a final recording and that's what we'll be evaluating when we go through these. Uploaded them to our folder on OneDrive, and then uploaded a bass tune and then we re, uh, um, relearned it so that way we can go through and do our next sequence of modifications. So we only changed one thing at a time except for the very last test. I went through and changed uh, a few things to mimic a commercial tune that's widely available out there. So this is the order of modifications. The first things that we modified were the shift pressures. We went through and changed max pressure A, max pressure B, max clutch pressure, and then max line pressure. Then we went through and changed the X, Y, and Z, just basically did the same pressure change on all three of those tables and ran uh, the, basically the, the upshift pressures um, modification. And then the adaptive, we went through with the oncoming preset and the offgoing pressure preset. I only changed one of those at a time. In reality, that would probably be something that would be a, a, a conjunction type change, but we just changed one of those at a time and did the uh, dyno runs. And then we went through and adjusted the shift timing tables. And specifically, we monkeyed with the torque adder, the transition time, and the desired output torque factor. Lastly, we did a bunch of modifications to the torque converter. So we changed the desired pressure, the apply ramp, the max pressure, the regulator gain, and the regulator offset. As most of you probably know, they've got lots of issues with the torque converters on these transmissions. So it's always interesting to see how going through and changing these torque converter values changed the pressure and the control in the torque converter. And lastly, we used a commercial tune. When I say commercial, I mean it's a company that does this stuff for a living and this is what they recommend. And we did that modification and we ran it on the dyno and measured the pressures and compared it just as well. And the way I did this is I went through and I took a transmission valve body um, and I tapped in all these little holes right here and all these little passageways are the basically the clutch apply passages. The, it's the pressure on its way to the clutches from the valve body. So this is the regulated pressures that the clutches end up seeing. And you can see I've got uh, five pressure taps here. So I got all the clutches except for the low reverse. I left it out because A, I couldn't get into it very well and B, it's not really a shifting clutch anyway. And then I've got the torque converter clutch. So inside the valve body, I tapped in and put pressure transducers on the 3.5R, the 1234, the 4.56, and the 2.6 clutches, and also the torque converter clutch. 
And on the outside, I also put a line pressure tab. So I've got a bunch of pressures being measured. And this is what it looks like. And up here, this is, a, this is what uh, Pico looks like. So these are all the pressure transducer values. You can look, I've got 20 seconds per division, and there's 10 divisions total on the screen. So there's actually 200 seconds per screen of recording, and it will record multiple screens. And like I said, this program is free. You can go to picoauto.com and download it. Once you download it, you can take the file and open it up and manipulate it around and measure stuff as needed. So this is that same image, just zoomed in a little bit. You can see the pulses that occur just before we end up applying the uh, 3.5R clutch. So this is the 3.5R, the shift from second to third in this example. So second gear is releasing and third gear is applying. If we were to kind of look at what we talked about with the phases, that would be like that fill and torque phase, and then that would be the inertia phase, and then it apply to the clutch holding phase. I think you can see it released pretty quick because my 3-4 um, my shift occurred. So that would be the fill and the torque and then the inertia and then the torque holding. So check out the next video in this series which is the baseline observations. That's where we look at the normal operation of this vehicle before we did any modifications and we kind of took a look at some of the pressure curves and some of the things that happen that were on the normal vehicle, something that we'll end up comparing them to.